Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Science, and today I want to discuss eigenvalues and eigenvectors of operators. This is another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. Operators are the mathematical objects that allow us to represent physical observables in quantum mechanics. When we measure a physical observable, the only possible outcome of this measurement is one of the eigenvalues of the associated operator. And after we have measured that property, the state of the system is the corresponding eigenstate of the operator. This means that to learn more about quantum mechanics, we first need to learn about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So let's go! Postulate 3 of quantum mechanics is the first of a series of postulates that describe the process of measuring. You will remember from postulate 2 that a physical quantity is represented by an operator, which we call an observable. Then postulate 3 tells us that the result of a measurement is one of the eigenvalues of the associated operator. This means that to understand measurements in quantum mechanics, the very first thing we have to learn about are the eigenvalues, and that we will see the eigenstates of an operator. This is precisely what I want to discuss in this video. To start, we need to remember that an operator A is a mathematical object that acts on a state phi and delivers another state phi prime. Before moving on, if you need a refresher about operators, check the video in the description. We now come to the definition of eigenvalues and eigenvectors of an operator A. We consider the action of A on a special ket psi, such that the only way in which A changes psi is by scaling it by a constant, and we obtain lambda psi. Lambda is the scaling constant, and in general it is a complex number. Now I can't emphasize enough how important the states psi and the scalars lambda are in quantum mechanics. The equation here is called the eigenvalue equation of the operator A. We call psi the eigenstate, or eigenket, or eigenvector of the operator A. These terms mean exactly the same in quantum mechanics. And we call lambda the eigenvalue of A. The prefix eigen that we use for all these quantities comes from German, and it means proper or characteristic. This is because the eigenvectors of an operator are those special directions in the vector space which the operator doesn't change. A final definition that we need is that the set of eigenvalues lambda is called the spectrum of the operator A. Before moving on to learn more about eigenvalues and eigenstates, I want to say something about notation. The eigenvalue equation is very often written like this in quantum mechanics. Remember that the label of a ket has no intrinsic meaning, it simply allows us to identify the particular ket that we're talking about. When talking about eigenkets, it is very convenient to label them by their corresponding eigenvalue, and this is what I have written in this equation. The lambda here is the eigenvalue of A, and the ket here is the corresponding eigenket. In the rest of the video I will use the form up here, but both forms are used very often in quantum mechanics, so you will see me using the one down here in many other videos. In the rest of the video I want to do two things. First, I want to look at some important properties of eigenvalues and eigenstates, and second, I want to discuss how we can calculate the eigenvalues and eigenstates of a given operator. So let's start with properties. The first property is that the eigenstates are only defined up to a constant. To see this, consider an eigenstate psi of an operator A with eigenvalue lambda. Then construct a new ket psi prime equal to alpha psi, where alpha is a constant. How does A act on this new ket? We first write A acting on alpha psi, then we can move A through alpha because A is a linear operator and we get this. Then we can use the fact that psi is an eigenstate of A and we get alpha lambda psi. As alpha and psi are scalars, we can exchange their order to obtain this new eigenvalue equation for A in terms of psi prime. So what does this mean? This is exactly the same eigenvalue equation we have here for psi, so indeed any multiple of psi is also an eigenstate of A with the same eigenvalue. What this also means is that all an eigenstate is telling us about is a direction in state space, and then any state along that direction, whatever its length, is an eigenstate of the operator with the same eigenvalue. To remove this freedom about the length of eigenstates, we will always work in terms of normalized eigenstates. What this means is that we will choose the alpha that will make the scalar product of psi with itself equal to 1. Eigenvalues and eigenvectors are of course not exclusive to operators in state space. You can define them for operators in other vector spaces, and they are useful in many different areas. But because state space is a complex vector space, there is one important extra subtlety compared to real vector spaces, which has to do with the global phase factor. Even after choosing alpha to make the length of an eigenstate equal to 1, we still have some extra freedom in the eigenstate. 
Imagine Psi is normalized, and then build a new state Psi prime by multiplying Psi by a global phase e to the i theta. This global phase is just a constant, so Psi prime is also an eigenstate of a with the same eigenvalue. Let's see what the length of Psi prime is. We start with the bracket here, we then use the definition of Psi prime, and to do this remember that to build a bra from a cat, we need to take the complex conjugate of any constants, so we get e to the minus i theta here. The exponentials combine to give 1, so we get psi psi, which is 1. This means that the length of psi prime is also 1, so even after normalizing an eigenstate in state space, we still have an extra degree of freedom coming from a global phase factor. This ambiguity is in fact true for any cat, not just for eigencats, as in this last derivation we haven't really used the fact that psi happens to be an eigencat of a. So what can we say about this extra degree of freedom? Physical systems have well-defined properties, so this freedom strongly suggests that whatever quantum mechanics tells us about nature, it will be independent of multiplying a cat by a global phase. Once you finish watching all the videos on the postulates of quantum mechanics, you will see how this is indeed true. The next property I want to discuss is the degeneracy of eigenvalues. We say that an eigenvalue is non-degenerate if there is a single eigenstate associated with that eigenvalue. We of course now know that what we mean by that is up to a constant alpha. By contrast, we say that an eigenvalue is degenerate if there is more than one linearly independent eigenstate with that eigenvalue. These of course are just names, but as you can imagine we only give names to important things. Degenerate eigenvalues bring in many subtleties in quantum mechanics, so we will constantly make this distinction. What I want to do next is to look at some of the mathematical consequences of degeneracy, because they are crucial to understand many ideas in quantum mechanics that I discuss in other videos. Imagine we have an eigenvalue that is n-fold degenerate. We write a psi i equals lambda psi i, where i runs from 1 to n and it labels the n linearly independent eigenstates that share the same eigenvalue lambda. Now imagine that I build a new cat psi as an arbitrary linear superposition of these eigenstates as shown here. What I want to show next is that psi is also an eigenstate of a with the same eigenvalue. To see this, let's consider a psi. Then we replace psi by its definition as a sum over psi i eigenstates. Then we can use the fact that a is a linear operator to move it inside and get this expression here. We can then use the eigenvalue equation for a here to write this in terms of lambda. Then we can take lambda outside the sum because it doesn't depend on i, and finally we obtain lambda psi. So what is this telling us? Any linear superposition of eigenstates in a degenerate n-fold subspace is also an eigenstate with the same eigenvalue. Now that we have talked about some of the properties of eigenvalues and eigenstates, the final question that remains is how do we find them? I want to start with a specific example, which I will call a simple case, the identity operator. The identity operator acts on a cat phi and leaves it invariant. Viewing this in the language of an eigenvalue equation, we see that any state phi is in fact an eigenstate of the identity operator with eigenvalue 1. This also means that the eigenstates of the identity operator are infinitely degenerate as they all share the same eigenvalue. So what have we just done? We have figured out the eigenstates and eigenvalues of an operator by simply looking at how this operator acts on states. This is something that you can do with the identity operator, just like with it, and also with some other operators like the projection operator or the parity operator. However, for an arbitrary operator it is typically not possible to figure out the eigenvalues and eigenstates simply by inspection of how the operator acts. So what we need is a more general approach to finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors. What I will do here is to make some general mathematical statements about how to find these solutions and what their properties are. I will keep the discussion abstract to give you an idea of what we're doing from a mathematical point of view, but the best way to learn about this is by doing. At the end of the video I will explicitly calculate the eigenvalues and eigenstates of an operator as an example, but in fact I do that for many other operators which are relevant to quantum mechanics in many other of my videos. So for more examples just have a look at those. To start we consider a basis u that is orthonormal, and we write the eigenvalue equation in the u basis. You will remember from the video on representations that to do this all we have to do is to project both sides of the equation onto the basis states u. Next, we insert the identity operator after the a operator in the left-hand side. 
Then we write the resolution of the identity in the U basis as shown here. We can take the sum over j to the beginning because the first two terms don't explicitly depend on j. And doing this, we obtain this expression. We then see that this term here is the representation of the operator a in the u basis, and these two terms are the representation of the eigenstate psi in that basis. As a reminder, these here are the explicit representations of the state and the operator. We can move the right hand side to the other side and obtain this final expression here. To write this final line, I have introduced the Kronecker delta ij, and you should convince yourself that it is correct. An easy way to see this is that the delta ij is the representation of the identity operator, just like the aij is the representation of the a operator. To make progress, let's copy the final expression we got for lambda and c. This equation is equivalent to the original eigenvalue equation up here, but now it is written in the u representation. Eigenvalues are the same in any representation because the original equation is independent of the representation. The physical meaning of the eigenvectors is also the same in any representation, but when we write them down mathematically, their form can change, and here we have them represented in the u basis in terms of the c coefficients. So finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors now becomes finding the lambda and c in this equation. What we have here is a linear and homogeneous system of equations for the unknowns lambda and c. We can also view this as a matrix equation where a and 1 are the matrices associated with the operators a and 1, and c is the column vector associated with the eigenstate. In quantum mechanics we call this the matrix formulation of the theory, and I have a video describing this matrix formulation, so check it out if you want to learn more about it. In this language, finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors becomes a mathematical exercise called matrix diagonalization, which is something that many of you will probably have encountered in other areas. What I want to do is to briefly discuss the mathematical features of matrix diagonalization, and I have linked a few external references in the description if you want a more in-depth refresher about this. For an n-dimensional state space, we have n equations for n unknowns. And mathematically, the solution to such a system of equations is found by setting the determinant of the coefficients to zero. This is called the characteristic equation, and solving it allows us to find the eigenvalues lambda. What can we say about these eigenvalues? The characteristic equation is an nth order polynomial equation for lambda, and such an equation has n solutions, typically called its roots, which in this context are the eigenvalues. For a general operator A, these n solutions can be real or imaginary numbers, and they can be unique, in which case we call them simple roots, or some of them can be repeated, in which case we call them multiple roots. Now I've said many things, but stop here for a moment, and make sure you remember this, because we're going to use it in the next slide. Once we have found the eigenvalues, what can we say about the eigenvectors? Let's first rewrite the eigenvalue equation. In principle, we can replace the roots lambda we found by solving the characteristic equation one at a time into the eigenvalue equation to find the corresponding eigenvectors c. Now, as we saw in the previous slide, we can have two types of root, those that appear only once, and those that are repeated. For unique roots, we will find one eigenvector. However, for repeated roots, or in other words, roots that have a certain multiplicity p, the situation is more complex. In general, we expect to find p eigenvectors associated with those p repeated roots. If the p eigenvectors are all linearly independent, and this is true for all roots, then that means that we will have a total of n linearly independent eigenvectors in our n-dimensional state space, and we will be able to diagonalize the matrix. However, if we find that some of those p eigenvectors are repeated, then we will not have enough linearly independent states and we will not be able to diagonalize the matrix. For our purposes, having such repeated eigenvectors could be a real problem. However, in quantum mechanics we're mostly interested in two specific types of operators, Hermitian operators and unitary operators. Luckily for us, in Hermitian and unitary operators we never encounter this situation. We can always find n linearly independent eigenvectors that allow us to diagonalize the operator. Okay, so this probably all sounds rather abstract. Again, I have links to external references in the description if you want to learn more about this. But from a practical point of view, all we really need to do quantum mechanics is to get enough practice in diagonalizing matrices. And this essentially amounts to following a recipe. 
This is why I want to finish looking at an explicit mathematical example of finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix. In the matrix formulation of quantum mechanics, let's consider an operator A given by this matrix, which I just made up, and the state psi given by this column vector. We want to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the operator A, and the eigenvalue equation can be written in the rack notation as shown here, or also in the matrix formulation of quantum mechanics, like this. We start by constructing the characteristic equation. We then write out the determinant explicitly. We then evaluate the determinant, which for a two by two matrix means multiplying the main diagonal and then subtracting the product of the off diagonal terms. Simplifying this expression, we see that indeed for a two dimensional state space, we get a second order polynomial equation and this equation should give us two roots. We can very easily find the roots or eigenvalues, which in this case are plus i and minus i. The next step is to find the eigenvectors. Let's start with the eigenvector corresponding to plus i. The eigenvalue equation then becomes this. We can calculate the matrix product and we obtain this equation. Comparing the first entry on both sides gives us minus c2 equals i c1, and comparing the second entry gives c1 equals i c2. These two equations in fact contain the same information. We can multiply the second one by i, and then operating through we find that we end up with the first equation. This means we only need to focus on one of the two equations, say the first one. A solution to this equation is c1 equals i, which then gives c2 equals 1, and we can then construct the eigenstate corresponding to eigenvalue plus i. We know that any multiple of this eigenstate is also a valid eigenstate, and in general we want to work with normalized eigenstates, so we normalize the state to obtain this. Remember that you can still multiply this normalized eigenvector by a global phase, which is essentially a number of magnitude one, and for example, multiplying this by i, corresponding to theta equals pi over two, gives this, which in quantum mechanics represents the exact same state as the original one. You should repeat the same exercise with the other eigenvalue, and you will find that the eigenvector in that case is this. When you compare your solution to mine, remember that they could differ by a global phase. Okay, this was a rather long video, but we're done. Diagonalizing matrices is an essential tool because it allows us to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of operators. These quantities are essential in quantum mechanics. For example, they play a key role when we measure the physical state of a system. This means that we need to get as much practice as we can in diagonalizing matrices, and if you want another example, check out the videos on the Pauli matrices. If you liked the video or would like to send me suggestions for future videos, please subscribe.